Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to finish learning the one to four player game, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, designed by Isaac Childress and published by Cephala Fair Games, who helped sponsor this video. Now, we've been covering the rules to this game's first five tutorial scenarios, and this is the final one. So if you haven't already, be sure to check out the videos we have for the first four scenarios, which you'll find links to in the description below. But otherwise, join me at the table, and let's see what we have left to learn. To set up this scenario, you'll turn to pages 10 and 11, and our map layout here also tells us to use the supplemental scenario book, turning it to page 4 and attaching it at the top. This map has two types of traps, the regular three damage traps we've seen before, but also these new muddle and poison traps as well. When you see these on the board, you now place this kind of trap token with a muddle and poison condition on them. Then, if a figure enters that space, instead of taking damage, they collect these conditions. We also have three monsters in this scenario. Zealots, which we saw last time, as well as Chaos Demons and a Blood Tumor. We have one, two, three separate rooms in this scenario, so as usual, we only add monsters to the starting one that contains our heroes. The Blood Tumor is a boss monster, and this is the first time we've seen one of these, so let's discuss how we set one up. A boss will have its own stat card, and you can put this into any one of the envelopes, because you won't really be using the sections of the envelope here. You just place the damage it receives anywhere. And you'll notice I put this in at level 1. The boss will also have an initiative token and ability deck, and these are shared by any boss monster that appears during the game. Most, although not all, of the cards in the boss's ability deck will refer to Special 1 or Special 2. And this directs you to use that related ability as numbered here on their stat card, which you would then resolve. Also notice, many of its stats are driven by the number of characters in the game, which is represented by the letter C. So in a game with two characters, this boss's total health is 20, its attack strength is 2, and you'll notice that instead of a 0 for a move stat, it has a dash. A dash means that no matter what, the monster won't move during the game, even if one of its ability cards refers to moving. That said, the monster can still be affected by push and pull effects, and could be moved when granted an action, and we discussed granting actions in a prior video. But if you need a reminder on that and how it works, you can always look it up in the rules glossary as well. You'll also notice that bosses can be immune to certain conditions, which will be shown here crossed out. The blood tumor, for example, can't be disarmed, muddled, or stunned. Remember, of course, that the boss won't be visible until this door is opened, and this is also where you'll read the section break here that introduces a new special rule. First, this tells us that the blood tumor will start with C times 4 damage. So in the case of our two-character game, that would be 8 damage total. Now that seems great, except from now on, any time another figure takes damage, whether it's a character or monster, the blood tumor will heal the amount of damage they suffered. So if I did 3 damage to this zealot, then 3 damage would come off of the boss. And then, as it says here, if the blood tumor's damage is ever fully healed, the scenario is lost. So you have to be careful what you attack after the boss is out, because the goal of this scenario is just to kill the boss. You don't have to kill all the other monsters to win, so keep that in mind. And now you're ready to play the scenario, but remember to deal out the battle goals to players and set up the element board as we learned about in the last video. This is a more challenging scenario than the previous ones, but if you manage to win, then you'll collect some pretty great rewards. Along with unlocking a new sticker to place on your map board, you're also told that each player gains 25 experience. And this is in addition to the usual six you get for beating a scenario, along with any that you might have collected on your dial. If you end a scenario with experience equal to or higher than the value under the next available level on your sheet, your character levels up. And at this point, each player's individual total should be over 45, so let's see how leveling up works. First, we'll mark that we're on the new level, and the important thing to remember is that your experience points don't reset to zero. You'll never lose experience, you'll just keep adding to it. So once you get to 95 or more total experience, you'll advance to level 3. After getting to level 2, as we just have, you'll get out the ability cards with a 2 at the top, and you'll pick one of these to add to your available pool of ability cards for future games. The remaining one you can return back to your box. Whenever you level up from now on, though, you'll get to add a new card this way that is equal to or lower than your current level. 
So when you hit level three, you could then gain one of the new level three abilities or the level two ability that you hadn't chosen before. When leveling up, you also gain a perk, so check off a box here, and your maximum hit points are increased as well. If you check your character mat, you'll see in this area your new starting health under your new level. Another benefit you'll gain that you won't find a reminder of on your character sheet is that once you reach level three, you'll be able to hold an additional small item. This is because you can always bring a number of small items into a scenario equal to half your level rounded up. So for example, at level five, you'd be able to bring three small items to each scenario. When you reach level five, open up this pack of ability cards that you'll find in your character box, and these have your higher level cards and some special instructions, which I'll leave for you to discover on your own when you're playing. Also remember, the game comes with these extra boxes, but don't open them until you're told to. As you play the game and your characters get stronger, the game will also adjust and increase in difficulty, which is known as the scenarios level. And this is not necessarily the same level as the characters. The normal way to assess scenario level is to find out the average level of the characters, divide that value by two, and then round up. Here, let me give you a quick example. Let's say it was later in the game and one character was at level four and the other was level three. You add those values together and then divide by the number of players to get the average, which in this case is 3.5. Then as instructed, we divide that number by two, giving us 1.75, which you'd round up bringing it to two. So there you go, a little mini Gloomhaven math class. But the point of that was to show you that the character level and the scenario level will not be the same. In the previous case, the scenario level worked out to be two. But in a situation like we have here, where both of the characters are now at level two, if you did that same math, the scenario level would work out to be one. But here's the reality. Players are free to adjust the scenario level as they like. I've given you the math for what they call a normal game, but if you want more or less of a challenge, then you can change the scenario level however you like. In any case, you then use the table shown here in the Learn to Play guide to determine what level you should set the monster stat cards to, how much gold you should get per money token, how much damage traps will do when activated, and the bonus experience you'll get when completing a scenario. All the scenarios we've been showing so far in these tutorial videos have been at level one, so these numbers should be familiar. That said, we've now covered all the rules to Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion's first five scenarios. The future scenarios will follow the rules we've learned and instruct you if anything changes. And the glossary is a great way to look up rules alphabetically if you need a reminder of how something works. That said, the very last page of the Learn to Play guide does have a few other tips and tricks to keep in mind, which I'll leave for you to look over on your own in detail, but let me give you a quick summary of the most important things that you'll find there. First, this tells you how to temporarily or permanently remove a player from a campaign you've already started or how to add one in. Basically, you'll just skip giving them the A and B ability levels and instead give them all of their level one and X ability cards and their character will start at level one. But then you use the average levels of all the characters playing, divide by two and round up to determine the scenario's level as we learned before and that will scale the difficulty for everyone playing. Another tip you'll find in this section of the rule book is that if you run out of a specific set of monster standees when setting up, just place any listed elite monsters first, then normal ones. Any extras, you get to ignore. In later scenarios, you'll also encounter monsters that have looting abilities, and when they loot a money token or a treasure, you just return those tokens to the tray with no effect. Some abilities may refer to empty hexes, and these are any that are within the walls of a scenario that do not contain difficult terrain, a figure, an obstacle, objective, or trap. That means this is an empty hex, and so are open doors, and destroyed obstacles and objectives. Unless, of course, a figure or trap is standing on them. Sometimes while playing, a scenario reward will tell you to close another scenario, meaning you'll cross it off the map and no longer be able to attempt it. There are 25 scenarios in the scenario book, but you'll never play all of them in a single campaign as you'll be given choices to make that will affect which scenarios you can attempt. Speaking of which, if you ever want to restart the campaign, you totally can. The map board can't be reset, of course, but this is just a visual representation of the scenarios you're currently playing and can be easily tracked by just using a pen and paper. 
For the cards, just group them by type and then put them in order based on the numbers you'll find here at the bottom of them. And this way, you can reset all of the characters. Then give every player a new character sheet. If you enjoy Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, there's a completely separate, even bigger, original Gloomhaven game that you can pick up. Just check your friendly local or online game store for it. It provides even more characters to choose from, scenarios to play, boxes to open, and secrets to discover. And the four characters in this game can actually be played as your starting characters in that game as well. Just check the back of the glossary to find instructions for how that works. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. Of course, keep in mind I won't be able to cover questions from the later scenarios, but do check the publisher's website for questions you might have or other great resources like the Board Game Geek website. Also, if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks for watching.